Even in the uh, world of giving talks and speaking, but also in a lot of other things, you can die from overexposure. Uh, but at the risk of that, uh, we're going to continue our series of The Mirror. <laughs> Because I know this started out as a one-week sermon standalone, and now we are into the middle of February, and this started January the 10th. So hopefully it'll be helpful to you this morning. But just to remind you, Romans 12, 1 and 2 from the message. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. It's something I think we need to memorize if we can. I've memorized it all these years in, in the NIV or maybe another version, but the message just helps me, just reminds me that God's goodness, and I thank you, Josiah, I didn't, I mean, I know I had glanced at the sheet uh, maybe yesterday or day before yesterday of the songs, but the goodness of God, eh, the reason I'm a little sniffly here, I always am. I think, like I've said before, I think I'm allergic to preaching because I each week have this. But uh, just to be reminded that he's brought us through the fire. Uh, man. The questions we've been asking, just a quick reminder, if it's your first Sunday, welcome. Uh, if it's not, hopefully you're kind of working through these yourself. But I know personally I try to work through them. One is, am I holding anyone else to a standard I wouldn't hold myself to? It's a tough question, and I need to be reminded of it. Do I consistently compare my best to someone else's worst? And what do I do with truth? And I'll come back to that in a moment, no wise fool evil. We don't have, to, don't have to put that up yet. And then the other one is, do you ever stand in marvel that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has created you in such a beautiful way in His image. And we'll talk about that today. I asked you last week are you writing checks with your mouth that your life can't cash? Talking about making promises, talking about making covenants, talking about those type of things. Uh, can you be counted on? Are you a person, if we made the list, if I'd given you a time, or if you'd taken the time, you, you had the time, I guess, but if I'd have challenged you last week as homework, if you'd have taken the time to sit down and make a list of people, you would say, if I, if they, if they tell me something, I can go cash that check. Because their life will back up whatever I believe they're saying to me. And again, that list many times is very short. But it's important to know who in your life that you can count on. And maybe just as important, I think, as we talk about the mirror, though, is are we individuals that other people can count on? That's really what this has been about, right? The whole sermon series has really not been about everybody else. This sermon series is about, and again, I don't mean this from a self-focused, uh, a, a self-absorbed, self-centered, but it is about me. Again, not looking to the left or looking to the right, but looking right here. S looking myself in the mirror. But the problem is many times, and we'll talk about it a little bit today and over the next few weeks maybe, but many times I can't see everything. 
when I look in this mirror. We talk about it often here in the teaching of Uncommon. There are three sides of me, three sides of you. There's a side of me I let you see, there's a side of me I don't let you see, and there's a side of me I can't see without your help. I didn't know I had a bald spot right there until Jan told me one day. Because I just can't see it. You know what I'm saying? I can't see now that we've got cameras and I can see it from the, you know. But there are parts sometimes. There are times I thought, one time I thought I had a little, a little pimple here. And, 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 and I've had them over the years. Had it bad as a teenager. So, hey, hey I'm with some of you guys. I've had to deal with that in your life. And, but so I still have them as adults. I have them pop up, and I don't know about any of you, but I have had, but I had one, and I thought it was one thing, come down and find out it was skin cancer. Sometimes you need to ask other people, right? <laughs> Sometimes you just need to go, I got to go ask somebody else. Somebody else has got to give me some information here, because what I am seeing, somehow or another, I'm not seeing well. I love asking questions. I, in many ways, love having questions asked of me because I am pretty comfortable in who I am. I've had people over the years ask me questions about my faith, about Christianity, and my answer many times is I don't know the answer to that. And I'm all right with that answer. But I will say to them what I say many times is, uh, I have said over the years, I don't know the answer to that, but if you're genuinely wanting to know the answer to that, I will walk with you with this, and we'll figure this out together. If you genuinely want to know the answer, of course, many times people are trying to stump you. They don't want to know the answer. But as we look at Scripture, and we go back to the start of Scripture, all the way to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and, 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 you know, for some of you, if you're here or you're just now new to Christianity or new to church, you may not know that Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and that's okay. I didn't, I've like said before, I didn't know when I became a Christian at 20, you know, 25, 26 years old, I did not know what the first book of the Bible was. So it's not unusual if you're just now kind of maybe listening online and going, okay, but at Genesis, the first few questions, I want to talk about the first two questions that basically were asked in creation since the beginning of time. I want to talk about those two questions today. We're going to read in Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 11, and they're found there's actually three of them here, but two are going to be the two that we focus on. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. I mean, you can hear the tone if you watched enough movies. You will not surely die. You will know. You you, you won't certainly die, the serpent. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Two questions, as relevant today as they were in the beginning of time. 
as important to each one of us as we look at ourselves in the mirror. I'm a guy who, I like looking at maps. I like looking at, how many, how many like atlases? I didn't even know they really still made atlases, but I love atlases. I like to know where I'm going. I like the bigger picture. I like to see that. I like to know all that. I like to know how it all ties together. How many of you here have no idea what an atlas is? It's okay. It's okay. Confess. Okay. But anyway. But I love those because I can see where I'm trying to go to and I see where I am. But as we look in Scripture, we look at this dialogue that happened between Satan and Eve. The guess is, I would guess, who knows? I mean, you, sometimes you start trying to read between the lines, but you, your assumption is this conversation wasn't this short. <laughs> the, the, the assumption is this came over time. The assumption is as this was being, who knows what the craftiness, the Scripture says he was, his cra- he was the most crafty, if you will, of all the animals. How long did this take? It usually doesn't take in a moment. It usually don't just wake up one day and try to make a bad decision. It usually takes time. I have a feeling this may have taken a, a good while. Who knows what time was like in the garden, right? But there was evening because we know that. So he comes to Eve and the first question, did God really say? Now, the ramifications of that are enormous because it's a debate that I think each one of us have probably on a daily basis, especially if you read the Word, especially if you want to walk in step with the Spirit as we talk about, especially there. We we wrestle with, did God really say? Because there is this tendency for each one of us to want to believe we may know as much as God does. I can look back on my life and knowing the parameters that God had set up for my good, and I still chose something else. For whatever reason, But you would think, and I look at this word crafty here. I thought that was an interesting word, so I looked it up. And the Hebrew word used for crafty is shrewd, or is crafty, of course, shrewd, prudent, sensible. We like using the word prudent because it would say, well, that would make sense. Let's do the prudent thing. A sensible uh, and Scripture uses it and, and interchanges it here, was with, with the enemy has a tendency to come to us with, with, with either planting in our minds or bringing from other sources, planting things to us that really do make sense. Well, that would make sense. Why wouldn't you want to know the difference between good and evil? Why would you not? Wouldn't God want me to know the difference between good and evil? Why in the world he must be holding out on me? His goodness somehow or another I'm beginning to question. I love that song again. Didn't know we were going to play it today, but I love that song. Uh, We begin to question God's goodness and his motive. Maybe he's holding out. The problem with knowing good from evil that God was trying to keep us from having to deal with is the fact that there are so many extremes on good and so many extremes on evil. All we got to do is look, and it's the, it's the easy, I know it's the easy, low, uh, uh, a low shelf kind of illustration, but Adolf Hitler and Mother Teresa. But all we got to do is bring it to modern times and what we see every day. You've got one in your house. I've got one. You probably have one on your body right now or in your purse or somewhere. And it's that little computer. 
that of course I can use that little computer to stay up with friends and family. Sure, I can use that little computer to buy goods and all those kind of things, but it also can be used to peddle pornography and also connect extremists and terrorists. It can be used for all kinds of things from the worst to the best. The difference, God did not want us to understand that, that once you delve off into good and evil, there are no limits. All you needed to do was walk and step with him. And it's the battle we've had ever since the beginning of time. It's that battle of the extremes, trying to stay somewhere in the middle. But our goal and our destination is to be like Christ. And true righteousness, Ephesians says, and true righteousness and true holiness, that's what we were created for. But we battle every day with the great lie, the great swindle. We talked about it a lot last week. I talked about it more in the context, briefly mentioned, but more in the context of especially a husband and wife or those to be married and the breaking of a promise. And we know that if you want to break a relationship, if you want to have zero relationship or damage that relationship, break trust. When I break trust, then I begin to question someone's motive. When that trust is broken, I question their goodness. Do they really want the best for me? God did not want human race to experience shame, grief, and sadness, and regret, and heartache, and ultimately death. But when Adam and Eve sinned, their conscience was activated. As I read this again this week, and really thinking about not trying to stretch out our sermon series, (laughs) just to stretch it out, but are there more questions here? A few things, like I said, that jumped out at me, maybe different, or one I've already mentioned, the word crafty or sensible. That the enemy's intent, the enemy's goal, the enemy th- is to get us close. Is to set up a counterfeit. To make us believe by getting outside of God's boundary we find freedom. But when reality is, not only does it not give us more freedom, it contracts the freedom. Not only does it not give us more freedom, it puts us in bondage. But the great swindle, the great lie is you get outside of God's parameters, you find freedom. And you begin to take, then you begin to exchange short-term gains for long-term losses. So I'd rather have this pleasure right now or do this thing right now. I'd rather have that even though I don't realize it yet. We've said it before here. If sin had more immediate consequences, there'd be less of it. But the problem is we'd rather have to exchange a short-term gain of pleasure or whatever it may be for a long-term loss. The great swindle, the great lie. The thief only comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. The only job, again, I've said this over and over, but I hope it somehow or another, repetition is the motor of learning. I've heard that years ago. That's how I coach basketball or whatever. It's that motor of learning is over and over. If sin had a job, its full-time job is separation. It's separation from God, separation from others, and separation from my divine purpose. 
Sin's job is separation. And the quicker we can get that in our head going, what is the deception here and what is the reality? Because the enemy, crafty, cunning is normally what that means there for for Satan in this sense. It is cunning, meaning he's up to something bad, okay? (laughs) Jesus says he is the father of what? Lies. That's all he does. But boy, will he try to bring that one thing so close. To convince you, convince couples, young couples, older couples, whatever couples, that somehow or another sex outside of marriage brings you closer together. When it was designed to be inside marriage as part of that covenant and promise that I will never leave you, I will never use you for my pleasure. So many things, but somehow or another it's whispered, oh, that's the sign of love. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by evil desires. And let me stop here. Only, but what I'm about to read is only there there because of what Jesus did on the cross through one man's sin we were all corrupted through one man's death we're all potentially brought back to life death and resurrection I might add but just picture this for a second Your old self, the self we're born with, the self we're trying to figure out, and and hopefully next week, I keep changing, so I'm trying to make sure I'm a man of integrity here on what I tell you here, what I'm planning on preaching next week. But it's called the edemic nature, the Adam nature, the nature that we're born with, the sinful nature, the old self. There's a lot of ways we get here. There's a lot of reasons why some still do better in culture and society when they get here versus others, even though they don't have Christ in their life. We could, we, there's a lot of things we could go talk, and we could spend hours talking about that. But either way, without Jesus, we're still all here, and we still will battle that old self to some degree till we see Jesus face to face someday. But there's a promise, and we talk about promises. What I love about this is to be made new. Let me pick back up on that. To be made new in the attitude of your mind. It goes back to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, right? By a new way of thinking, no longer corrupted by the ways, that's no longer being drugged down by the ways that be. Check your thinking and how you're lining up at the way the world thinks. A new attitude in your mind. And to put on the new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We were created and we can be renewed and restored back to. Be renovated back to. What we were originally designed for. Scripture talks about the fruit of the Spirit and talks about the things we can begin to show. One of those is goodness. 
I, I, I looked this, I looked, I, I, I probably, you, you know me, I butcher the English language, so I'm sure going to butcher anything else. But urate is the, uh, is the Greek term here and, uh, of goodness. That we are supposed to have goodness. We're supposed to begin to reflect goodness. And I looked at this definition and I just loved it. And thought, man, I would want to be that. And the translation here is a collective of qualities like valor, virtue, authenticity. It is the real character of someone who doesn't just do right things, but someone who consistently produces goodness out of what they have stored up within them. I want to be that person. That I just produce it, and not because I'm just trying to do good things. I'm producing it because of what God has done in me. That I have been created to be, to be in true righteousness and true holiness. That's what God created when I begin to put off the old self and not listen to all the lies and its deceitful nature. I have an opportunity to be a person of virtue and valor and authenticity. Where I, everywhere I go and what all I do every day, there is an opportunity of God working through me as I walk in step with the Spirit to produce goodness, which is a reflection of God. Because it's stored up in me. You've heard me say it's, it's not always trying to quit doing certain things. The, the goal is, is to become more like Christ. And when I become more like Christ, I allow that to happen, walk in step with the Spirit. Certain things just have to go away. They don't have room anymore. Instead of just, well, i got to stop doing that. i got to no, just become more like. But here's the second question. The second question, all time in Scripture. Of course, my third question is my favorite. It's always been my favorite question in Scripture. And it it makes me feel a little weird when I say this. Who told you you were naked? That's just a great line. I don't know why I like it. Out of context, it would seem a little weird. That question goes back to the question I'm about to ask you, the question that God asked. Why was Adam and Eve running around? Why were they running around sewing fig leaves together? Why, why were they running around trying to cover themselves up and, not, and hide? And Why were they? Because as soon as their conscience was activated, shame came into the world. They not only put fig leaves on, they hid. You ever hid from God? I did it for a decade. On occasion, it pops up even now. (laughs) I just don't want to deal with that, God. I don't want, because I believe God many times allows you. you, You're not worried. I I appreciate Dr. Dan a few weeks ago, not only his whole message, but one of them is, so, you, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but so you haven't committed adultery. Good job, basically. Most of us haven't. But that's a long ways from where we hope to be. Tra- you know, again, that's part of it, sure. That should be. But to be like Christ? We may not hide an affair or we may not hide an addiction, but but, but we have a tendency to hide. Sometimes we hide from the calling. Sometimes it's not even a a sin, quote-unquote sin, that everybody goes, well, that's a bad sin, man. Dude, you need to take care of that. Okay. But sometimes it's even God looking for us going, I am calling you. I'm calling you out of that. I'm calling you.
Can, can you imagine this? Scripture tells us in the cool of the evening, God was walking through the garden. Now, it's hard, and this is the second part I was going to tell you. Sometimes I read, I've read it, I don't know how many times this passage of Scripture, but it just, I don't know, this week kind of struck me going, what would that be like? Because often right now, if you're in your, this temperature here in Arizona, this time of year, in the evening, if you go out, there's a chance you're going to go out walking. There's a chance you're just going to see a lot of people. And you just go out walking. Oh, there's Adam and Eve and God over there. That's the Joneses. That's the Smith. No, yeah, it's Adam. What? I'm going to guess the cool of the evening in the garden was whatever your perfect temperature is and weather. <laughs> whatever that was. Jan knows, I've said it multiple times to her, fall is my favorite time of year, not spring, even though I love spring. In Arizona, though, it means the heat is coming. <laughs> the only unfortunate part of that. But the reason I love the fall I love about 5.30 or 6 in the fall. Gets dark early. Start get dark, especially if you're in Arkansas. Maybe the time has changed. That's where I'm going to with this. It takes me back to a 16, 17, 18-year-old in Wicks, Arkansas. And that temperature and those leaves falling, deer season's about to start. And basketball season has started. It's my perfect time. It means nothing to you. I just think that's what it would have been like. Maybe walking through the garden, me and God. Leaves are falling. 60 degrees outside. Just a little bit of nip in the air. And we're just walking and talking. And as I read that, again, it seems like that was a daily activity, however all that works. I don't understand all of it in, in the garden. I'm not going to try to tell you I know all that. But it says in the evening. I, I think at two times in God's sovereignty of always been, The time that he went to walk with Adam and Eve and they were not there and the cross. And again, I don't know, understand all the sovereign. I don't understand all, but the heartache. But they weren't there. Oh, they were there. And they thought, if I hide and look in the mirror and say to myself, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. If I said the lie long enough, somehow or another I'd convince myself, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay. And friends, you can look in the mirror at times and that be correct. Or at least you can be okay with God. But if you're hiding, you can't say that. God could have been upset. He could have wiped the whole thing out. <laughs> I don't know how all that works. And I'm okay. But what I do know is, he asked the question that still ask of us today. Where are you? I love that line in that song. His goodness is coming after you. What I love is that what he asked me personally at 16, 17, 18 years old, where are you? He came back, he, he kept asking, and finally, when I was 26, I was able to answer, I, 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 where I am, I'm lost. Without you. 
Finally, I was able to answer the question that I should have been answering for a decade. When, I, when he says, where are you, Kurt? I didn't know what else to say. I didn't know what the first book of the Bible was. All I knew to say at that moment was, I am lost without you. Adam and Eve represented the human race. They knew they were lost. At least they're ahead of some of us. The reason why they hid, they knew they were lost. But the second question in Scripture resounds to the ages. Where are you? You know we talk about it here often. We're going on a trip. I don't know if we've got that slide. If you're going on a trip, location, 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 location. Great with real estate or whatever else. God bless them. But man alive. What I have realized more and more over the last decade is I need to get good information on where I am. Most of us avoid. The reason why those three questions that I have talked about for the last six weeks, the reason why they are so important in my opinion is because if I don't answer those, I don't have to, if I don't even look at those, I don't have to answer where are you. I just try to define where you are. And I would just make that a full-time job. But the whole part of the whole mirror series has been about transformation, and it is about here. Where am I? But after 35 years of marriage, almost 30 years of ministry, ministered raising four kids, two grandkids, uh, hundreds of hours of ministry and all travel and all those kind of things. The, be- the hardest thing to come conclu- to conclusion with over those years is that the hardest thing in my life to deal with is me. It's not you. Oh, I can be honest about what I see about you. The problem is I don't really like being honest about what I see about me. And I really don't like being honest about what you see about me if I trust you. But I can make it a bit of a full-time job being honest with what I see about you. But God's question is not, where are they? Where are you? I heard years ago, if you're going to preach a sermon, one thing you better do is give them hope. What is so awesome about this God we serve is his goodness is coming after you. He loves you. He's on your side. He's coming after you. He's relentless. And even though it may be 10,000 steps away, it's always only one step back. His motives and goodness have always been the same since the creation of time as it is for you today. He set parameters up and he has set parameters up for us to keep us from getting hurt. And harmed. Self sovereignty is a delusion. And not only damages you, it damages those who are connected to you. But when we're able to answer the question, when you put a pin on it, bing, that's where I am. That's the place to start. You can't start from somewhere you're not. Start from where you are. 
and be honest. Craig Rochelle, you've heard me say before, you're as strong as you are honest. Our freedom we're looking for is not freedom from God's boundaries. What self-sovereignty tells, tell, would tell us that whatever choices I make, I get to choose the consequences too. That's idiocy. That's self-delusion. Whatever I choose, I get to choose the consequences also. Really? But freedom, I think we all seek freedom in the Spirit. And something the Lord gave us years ago that we have, uh, that gave me years ago, we've used here over and over, the true freedom. The ability to know what you should do. The desire to want to do it. And the faith and power to live it out. The ability to know what you should do. We need to be in step with the Spirit. We need to be in Romans 12, 1 and 2. That we will know what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The ability to know what we should do. Be in a community of believers that we trust. Be in a community of believers or around people that we believe will hold us accountable to what we say we want to be. The reason why most people don't go public is because somebody will hold them accountable to it. The ability to know what you should do, the desire to want to do it. It's crazy that what our nature is meant to go away from God, but when God's Spirit begins to get a hold of us, we desire to be more like Him. It's crazy. He changes our passions. He changes our desires. It's not just I quit doing something. He, he literally changes your desire to want something you never would have wanted on your own. You couldn't. Then the faith and power to live it out. True freedom. True freedom. Revival. I asked Josiah and him to come on up. We close. Revival. Oh, sure, it will start when other people change too, but where it begins is right there. When God begins to revive my heart, begins to revive me to be more like him, for me to be able to answer when I begin to hide, to come out and just trust. Because the reason why you can come out from hiding with God is because you trust him. They didn't know, right? They had never experienced that. They didn't know. But God's goodness and God's faithfulness all those years have shown us that when we come out of hiding, God is so loving. He is walking. Just like Jesus is the example, that's how much he loves us. He comes searching for us. And like I've said before, he didn't put us on a mountaintop, a high mountaintop, like Mount Everest, and say, if you can scale to here, then I'll love you and forgive you. And some might have made it, but most of us won't. The way came to us. Over these next few weeks, Hope and pray you'll be here and be challenging you. But one of the questions, as we talked about last week, are you the type of person that whatever comes out of your mouth, your life can back up? And you go, I don't know. Then the next question is, where are you then? Where are you on that? Do you desire that? What, what, what do you? It's more than just simple promises. It's a life. That people can count on. We're we're, we're human. We will fail. I'm not saying that. I may not be what I want to be yet. But I'm not who I used to be. Putting off the old self and being raised in it. to pray and then we're going to sing as we get out of here today. I'm going to ask you if you're 
Somebody know this is stirring in you to some degree. What we've been talking about. I'm not trying to embarrass you. We're hopefully before long or maybe we're all open these altars back up in a different way. Some of you will be new to you because you haven't had them open in a while. But I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to stand where you are. Not every one of you. Just those who feel like right now they want to be a part of this prayer. As I pray over God to begin to till the soil and to open up. And if you are open to God going, not just where are you, but open to the Romans 12, 1 and 2 to be the type of person that your life can cash checks. If you're there right now, just stand where you are. Just stand, and I'm going to pray as we close. Thank you. Lord, we come before you today knowing that whether we've been following you 30 years, 35 years, longer or shorter, Your desire for us is to always be becoming more and more like you. And Lord, I pray right now that you are tilling the soil of people's hearts and minds. That they would reflect not only your image. And Lord, even a word we use today, your goodness your goodness that out of what is stored up in us kindness generosity and valor and virtue and authenticity would flow out of our lives because of what is stored up in us but Lord I pray over our folks here or in those online or wherever they are Lord that maybe this week as they ponder, as they look in the mirror, to ask that question that you have sent through the ages. Where are you? Lord, thank you now for this group. Thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together. And we love you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand? We're going to close in a song. Thank you. <laughs>